All right, 7.03 is your time right now. We turn to COVID-19. Starting today, Ontarians who received their first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine can now choose between that second dose of AstraZeneca or an mRNA vaccine. So we're talking Pfizer or Moderna. But as more options open up, there seems to be more confusion and hesitation on which to choose. Let's break things down. We welcome back infectious diseases expert, as well as member of Ontario's Vaccine Task Force, Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Good to see you again. All right, you are the perfect person to break this down because I all the conversations I've had here uh, with many people who've had dose one of AstraZeneca and they are just sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do. So let's let's break down the scenarios if we can and look at what it means. If, if you went AstraZeneca to AstraZeneca, why would that be a positive? I think, as you point out, there could be positives and negatives uh, that people might consider. I think the key thing is contextualizing it to the individual and really speaking with the health care provider if people have any questions about this. But we know, for example, if people end up choosing to have a second dose of AstraZeneca, there's a track record with this. We've watched in, the, for example, places like the United Kingdom. It's, it's, uh, the, the vaccine is used as it was intended to be used in, and as was used in the clinical trials. And we see the the you know, effectiveness that this that this truly has. So it's a good vaccine. It really works. Uh, it works against the variants of concern. Uh, it works. It really provides people with pretty impressive protection against COVID-19. I, I do want to go back to the variants of concern in just a moment. But now here's the question mark for a lot of people. And, and I just had these conversations here in the studio. Uh, dose one AstraZeneca and now many contemplating the MR and, and mRNA vaccine. So Pfizer or Moderna for their second one. Uh, if we use the case studies of, of what we've seen in the UK as well as the Spanish study, what have you seen and what does the research say on, on positives and negatives for doing that? Yeah, so certainly if we think about, people are thinking about mixing and matching the vaccines and having a second dose of the mRNA vaccine, um, you know, there's a couple of things. One is that in some of the clinical studies that have come out of the United Kingdom and Spain, yeah, some people will have more symptoms after that. And fortunately, they, they're not, they don't appear to be severe at all. Like no one, for example, landed themselves in hospital, but it does appear to be more frequent. And, and certainly people might have a headache or uh, fatigue or a fever. Uh, but again, it, it, it did not appear to be on the severe end of the spectrum. The other interesting thing was uh, some of the data out of Spain really demonstrated that when they measured the antibodies, the person's immune response after this mixing and matching, uh, they, it, uh, it did seem to produce more antibodies with that. So, you know, they're, they're, when people are considering this, I think uh, it, there's lots to take into account. Um, and and for, personally, uh, we, we, there are surveys done. We know that some people want to have a second dose of AstraZeneca. And that's great. We know some people want to have a second dose of an mRNA vaccine and not have a second dose of AstraZeneca. That's also great. I think the key thing here is that the nuance is important. Contextualizing it to the individual is important. And, and sometimes I think it would be very helpful if people have some sort of, it's, uh, if people are confused or aren't entirely clear what the best choice is for them, it's a good idea to chat with the healthcare provider about this because you can walk through this, you can walk through the data, and you can make a decision that's best for you. That sounds good. Uh, let's, let's talk about the variants of concern, uh, specifically now known as the Delta variant, so first detected in India. Research is starting to come out about whether or not vaccines are effective in protection. Uh, what have you seen so far in some of the data? Yeah, it's interesting because England's now released a couple of data sets and the most up-to-date one was actually released yesterday. Uh, you know, there's a few high-level points that come out of this. One is that this, this variant is more transmissible and, and it actually is taking over. We all remember the variant initially discovered in the United Kingdom, also known as the B117 variant. We have to have 100 names to make it as confusing as possible. But this newer variant, this one that was initially discovered in India, or the B1617 variant, also known as the Delta variant, is more transmissible and it's taking over. The second thing is it may, keyword may, cause more significant symptoms and more significant illness compared to the other ones. But the third point is that it still appears that the vaccines work. They work. I mean, uh, the based on the data that's come out, uh, vaccines certainly appear to be very protective against this. But the caveat here is that you really need two doses. One dose provides some protection, but two doses provides much more robust protection. So you'll see in places, in, well, for example, in Ontario and perhaps elsewhere in Canada as well, you're going to see these second dose fast approaches and you'll see second doses prioritized in people at greater risk of having a severe outcome, such as those with underlying medical conditions or those on the older end of the spectrum. And you may also see uh, second doses prioritized in hotspot neighborhoods as well. 
Okay, I know you have a very tight schedule, so I do want to ask you one last question. Um, there's a lot of back and forth with the government saying, uh, could we reopen a little bit earlier for stage one or step one prior to that June 14th date? We heard Dr. David Williams say, not so fast. We're looking at the data from the long weekend. Uh, what is your take on, you know, a potential threshold on to move the reopening up or not? Three key metrics, three key metrics. Number one is hospital capacity, including ICU capacity. Now, it's important to recognize that our ICUs are getting better and they're slowly, keywords slowly getting decompressed, but they're still pretty full. And in fact, there's more people in the ICU now, even though the trajectory is heading downward, there's more people in the ICU now with COVID-19 related illness than there was at the peak of the second wave. Getting better, but getting better slowly. The second thing is what is the community burden of COVID-19? And that's where we look at the daily counts, the seven day averages, the percent positivity of tests. And the third metric to look for is vaccination status and how fast we're rolling out first doses of vaccines. And of course, with this variant of concern initially discovered in India, the Delta variant, it's also important to really consider our second doses of vaccines as well. Doesn't mean we all have to have two doses of a vaccine before you can start to reopen. It just means that it's a consideration to see, you know, what is the coverage of first and second doses. So those are the three key metrics that they'll be looking at closely. And again, I mean, it's already, what is it, about June 4th, I think. I can't keep track. <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, we're... <laughs> We're getting there. Like, we're getting there. I mean, it's going to be soon, and uh, and, and at the, at probably at the latest, it's only going to be 10 days, and it might even be earlier than that based on those three metrics. Yeah, I also had to look at my calendar, and yes, I can confirm it is June the 4th. All right, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, always appreciate your time. Thank you, and have a great weekend. Be well. You too.